see icons size size also will vary so less frequent callers will come here as smaller icons La, most more frequent callers will come here and even the number of calls will be shown here so very complex control and when you press seven more this control will expand and will show each call as a single row so this is a very complex control that's where i said when you say will not draw is set when you press seven more it will not expand actually because this will take care of the drawing it will not draw so that's the example of that now optimizing the android application so uh, what we do is we uh, most of the time uh, we have a a set of few phones that we test on, probably emulator or things, and uh, we test this in the few devices. There, are, for example, there are like when we launched one of the apps, there were 768 compatible devices in the market. So we are not going to test for 768 devices anyways. That's not going to happen for a startup. But what we can do is we can adhere to the uh, you know guidelines and make sure that our app works on this. We can assume that, and it works most of the times. So what happens is we have a, a decent mobile, maybe like a Nexus One or a HTC a Google I mean, Galaxy S2 or something and we test on that and it works fine but the problem with Android phones is that uh, there are many people who use phones with very small footprint a very small memory capability and things like that and your code might fail there are a lot of combinations that come in like uh, QVGA with 2.1 to you know HVGA with 2.3 to a lot of combinations there are a lot of permutations coming happening so unless you optimize your code based on the guidelines it, it might crash on few of the devices so I'll tell you some of the guidelines that we, we follow and we found out which will help reduce this. First thing is, I'll, I'll come to that, okay, uh, so that's what I said. So it, it scales up and down based on devices and uh, best practices are used and let us make uh, the best use of memory and battery processing. So uh, for I'll come, first come to the memory, memory part. What we do is whenever we have a list view. I'm still stuck with list view. So when we have list view and it has a lot of images, as you flick it, if there are hundred more elements, sometimes it crashes and gives you gives you an out of memory exception. So this happens when you have images, because images take a lot of memory, and uh, when you don't properly handle it, it easily crashes. You know, even if it's a good device like Galaxy S2, if you have hundred plus ima uh, images in a list and you just flick it, it'll crash. If not in the first time, you just uh, you know take the uh, layout, make it landscape portrait, landscape portrait, four times will crash because the memory leak is happening there. So what we do for that is, the common myth is everybody does this step, system to run finalization is called the garbage collector and you, you believe that everything is fine, all the garbage is collected. But the problem is, the definition of garbage is very, very different from what we perceive. It's not that if we can say that, okay, this is not more in, any more use, so this should be a garbage that, that the system doesn't understand like that. So there are a set of uh, tools in, uh, you know, Android uh, ADT developer tools which can actually help you find out if there's a memory leak if you're using the memory efficiently. So one of them is just look at the locket. I think everybody's familiar with locket. Yeah. So uh, what you can do is you might see these kind of things. You see, I'm sure you have seen this and you have just ignored it, like I also did. So uh, what this says is exactly says that the current state of your you know memory usage of your application. This says that this is the soft limit for your this is the soft limit for your uh, your internal memory. That's the program memory that for the memory allocation of the objects and things like that. The next one, the the second one, external says uh, the memory allocated for the resources like the images and things like that. So once uh, your memory allocation touches 8.5, like 8 8k, it again upscales it to maybe 10k. The soft limit is set again to 10k. It, when it touches 10k, it again it goes like that. But there's a point, like yesterday I think if you have, uh, you were there in the session by, uh, for the memory operation, they'll say there's a limit for the memory for each application. I think it's 16 MB or something. So when this combined value goes out of 16 memory, you are done, the app crashes. So how, uh, you, you can just watch for this, just put a locket filter and just flip your phone up and down, like landscape portrait, portrait landscape. You do it five times and you'll see this, this will be growing this thing will grow. That means there's a leak, there's a leak in your program. So first you should understand what are these parameters. These are defined in the Android developer documentation, you can go and see that. I think explicit means the, as I told you, the uh, memory allocated for the external thing. Uh, for malloc means, uh, because there's no more memory left, uh, it, when the malloc was called, the OS is forced to call a, you know, GC. And GC concurrent means that there are a lot of objects already ready for, you know, uh, garbage collection, so it thought that it's the best take some time. So if you're in between the list scrolling, if you're calling GC, it'll it'll scroll smoothly for some time. Suddenly it'll stop, 
for a few seconds, maybe a, a second, but it will be visible because you're smoothly scrolling a list. If you're flipping the list, uh, suddenly it stops and then moves again. So that will be uh, irritation for your UI. So you can also use a tech, uh, you know, um, a tool called Memory Analyzer tool. That's also part of the Android, uh, you know, ADT. And a very good session is given about MAT uh, in the Google I/O session. I, I think that's a be the best way to understand that is uh, watching that session. That's a one-hour session. He clearly shows how memory leak starts from an, in an application and where how to peg it, things like that. It's a very detailed session. And next, I'll come to another uh, important topic, topic uh, wherein how you can peg this GC. The GC problem is. Okay, I'll come to hard reference and soft reference. I'll show you what exactly how exactly GC works and things like that. And another important point is that images are the most uh, common you know, memory hoggers in our applications. So even if you are using one single image, like I told you, when you if you have supported both resolution, uh, both uh, orientations like landscape and uh, portrait, when you flip around, it will, the images footprint might be growing. So try to minimize the size of the image. It's good in both case of runtime and also in packaging your app. You know, some phones, most of the phones even today has a very limited internal memory. So your phone doesn't support SD card, moving to SD card. And if your phone is running 2.1, there's no option also. So for application like 10 MB, uh, nobody's gonna, you know, download it. They'll say that it's too big for my phone. So try to minimize, the, in that aspect also, try to minimize the memory used by your image. Or even otherwise, when the runtime also, it's gonna cause a problem for you. So like, I think last session there in the top, they were talking about how to use nine patch images. So use nine patch images wherever possible. So that will really, really bring down the image size. For example, uh, a button icon, uh, button background image, which was like 30 KB will come down to like two KB with nine patch, if it is nine patchable, first thing. And also if there's no transparency, go with JPEGs instead of PNGs. See, even if you, uh, one more interesting fact is that we have tried to, you know, optimize the PNGs from Photoshop other tools to reduce the memory of the PNG so that like, by probably you know uh, reducing the resolution and things like that. But what Android does is before compiling and making the package, it actually reformats the PNG. It compresses by itself. So whatever compressing you have done beforehand for the PNG is going do down the drain because Android again will do the, and it will only be as good as the compression used by Android. So PNGs have that problem. So uh, stick with JPEGs if you don't have transparency, and only when you need transparency use PNG. So I'll come back to. Uh, you know the weak references and strong references or soft references. You can call it weak references versus so strong references or you can say soft versus hard. So what are strong references? I have a class called foobar. I am initializing an object with that. Now what is happening? I am putting it in the hash map. Now this uh, function goes out of uh, say use. So the actual foobar is supposed to be gone for you know memory uh, garbage collection. But since the memory, the object is still in the hash map, it is referenced hard way. In a hard, there's a hard reference to the object in the hash map. This object is not gonna die until the hash, hash map also is dying. So what happens is even if the foobar is not in use, it's still uh, in in the memory. It will not be uh, available for garbage collection. This is a very simple example. When you have uh, you are assigning an object to multiple multiple uh, variables, what happens is there are a lot of strong references to this object. So even though the original object is gone out of scope, the object is still referenced by somewhere, though not in use, they are like uh, the dormant and they, they'll remain in the memory, unless it goes out of memory and the app crashes. This is a strong reference scenario. So these strong references are not at all eligible for garbage collection. It will never be collected by garbage collector. So what we can do for this is, we can, there's a class called a weak reference and use the weak reference, uh, you know, class and then if you assign that to the uh, foo using the weak reference, what it will do is the code, um, the, the weak reference is not direct, uh, the weak reference will be the one uh, object that will actually hold the reference for the object. And for each places, uh, you can actually say uh, weak foo dot get and it will return you the object. So what it is returning is a weak reference of the object. So I'm put, if I'm putting the hash map into the list, I'll be putting here, I should have put the code also. Like weak, um, weak foo dot get I'll have put. So uh, it is not actual reference. There's no hard reference to the actual object. The actual object is held only by the weak reference class. So uh, when this actual weak reference class goes out of scope, it's available for garbage collection. So there are actually different kinds of weak references. One is weak reference, as I told you, and the soft references. Uh, the difference between weak reference and soft reference is very subtle. Um, soft reference will weak reference is what will do is. Whenever the object is gone out of scope, it will automatically make it available for garbage collection. 
But software, what it will do is, it will retain for some more time, so that if the memory is allowing you to do that, if there are a lot of memory available for you, it will still hold that object, it will not kill that object. So the hash map will still be able to access that object, even though the original object has gone out of scope. That's if, if at all, there is a memory available. So software is a little bit more, you know, uh, what to say, uh, lenient on re releasing the actual object. And there is another phantom, phantom reference. This, this, this is a really um, different thing, which is only used, okay, I will get into that. Uh, whenever you actually, uh, whenever you actually put an object in the reference, and when it is the reference, that is when the object goes out of scope, it is put into a reference queue. So the reference queue will hold all the dead objects. And next garbage collection uh, cycle, it will be killed. So in both weak references and strong um, soft reference, you can actually uh, go to the reference queue and retrieve the dead object. You can resurrect that object. So uh, in in phantom reference, even that is not allowed. Phantom ref reference makes sure that when it's it's gone out of scope, it's completely gone. That is about the uh, okay. The gist about that is try to use a weak reference class or a soft reference class, whichever you feel is good for you. And uh, this is this is not used actually anywhere. I have not seen any case where it's used. And uh, if you use a weak reference, uh, the garbage collector will be much much more uh, capable to release objects that are not used. Next is optimizing the layouts. I talked about the optimizing memory using these techniques. Now I'll talk about optimizing layouts. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll go through using two two tools that ADT provides. One is Hierarchy Viewer. Hierarchy Viewer, as it says, it it is a tool that is available with the Android SDK that will actually show the hierarchy of your view. Like I showed in the first slide, it'll show a little bit more, you know, graphically the actual hierarchy from left to right. From the la linear layout, you have a probably a ready layout inside your list, list items, things like that, and it'll show the whole hierarchy. And it this is one example. In the hierarchy, this is one object. Say in the end, you have a button. It'll, it'll show you three three color, uh, three you know dots in that. These dots represent the time taken by that object to get drawn. First thing is, I guess, uh, time taken to measure. Second is time taken to put the layout. Third is the time taken to the draw, uh, for to execute a draw call. And this color coding will tell you whether it's healthy or not. If it is green, it means that it, it has taken a time less than 50% of the. Uh, it is faster than 50% of other objects in that same layout. If it is yellow, it is it is slower than 50% of the other layout. And if it is red, it means it's the slowest object. So when you actually run an application on the uh, device, you can plug it in and you can see the view hierarchy runtime in the real time, and you can see which object is misbehaving, which object is taking the most time to draw. So this is also useful when you're uh, you're designing your own custom controls. So you can make sure that whether your control is the your control is behaving properly or is it taking longer time to draw, measure, or even uh, putting the layout. So Using this tool, we can actually peg the um, uh, rendering speed. We can find out which is a uh, which is a problem creator. And this, but the problem is it works only on developer devices. But I think that's good enough. And uh, it shows the entire view hierarchy of, of the activity to take and a time taken for each view to draw. So I, as I told you, the color coding also. Another another tool is layout opt. Layout opt is another command line tool provided with the Android SDK. When you know, uh, first you run view hierarchy and find that say this object is a problem creator. The red dot is there in this object. So what will you do next? How will you know that why is this object slow? So what you can do is the first step you can do is you can take layout op. You can run this layout, an XML layout through the layout top. It will tell you the most probable reasons, the most probable guidelines you have missed. Probably you have, say, you have put an invalid object, you have used an object that is never drawn, uh, things like that. There are the errors of the logical errors in the XML layout file will be picked up by the layout op cloud, a code and it will also suggest uh, the remedies if it is possible. Most of the time it, it, it gives a good suggestion. So with these two tools you can actually peg the layout drawing issues from the XML's perspective. Next thing is, very important thing, we do great apps, apps look really good, uh, the UI is great, it works great, the only problem is it drains your battery into us, your phone dies into us. And that's a common comment that you see in most of the good apps in the Android market. And this happened to us also. We did a very good app, but the problem is it drains of the battery a lot. What, what is the reason? So even if you have a very powerful phone, say you have a very uh, good phone with a dual core processor and a lot of memory, the bat battery is always a bottleneck. You know the battery is going to drain. If, as a, you know if it becomes dual core, it's going to drain only faster. So what to do about that? So uh, there are a set of optimizing techniques that you can use. These are a, even even if it's not about battery, it's a very good 
uh, practice to follow uh, on how to use a battery and network judiciously. You know, uh, we when we write apps, I am talking about apps which are connected to the network, which fetches information from the internet, or probably uses location GPS to find out where you are. These kind of apps use a lot of sensors, and you can actually do a, a check before you actually use the network. For example, if you're in a roaming, you are in a roaming state, or if there's no Wi-Fi network, if there's no internet, there's no point of you calling the HTML, uh, you know, HTTP request to the server. It is anyway going to fail, but you're actually going to drain the processing and battery time. So before calling network or GPS or things like that, first put a check on the function, see if there is a network available, see if GPS is turned on. This kind of simple checks will actually, uh, you know, uh, elongate your apps a time in the phone at the time, the battery time will be really go uh, higher. And another simple but uh, some uh, thing that most people don't follow is using of wake locks. Uh, if you don't know wa what wake lock is, when you are using an app, say you are watching a video, the screen locks after 5 seconds. Uh, in beginner's app this happens but uh, when you google search you know you find what the reason is. The reason is that you have not set a wake lock. If you watch a video in the YouTube app it will never, uh, it will never you know lock the screen will never die. That's because they have acquired a wake lock. Wake lock is something, see the Android architecture is like this. When you are doing something, when the phone is idle for some time, the, there's a timeout that is set in the settings that you can manually change. After this timeout, the go, uh, system will lock, the screen will lock, the screen will die, the touchpad, uh, the keyboard if it is there, the backlighting will go and actually the processor goes to suspend mode except for some essential services like phone calls and you know, network all the system is in a suspend mode. So, if your apps need to run on the background, there are pretty different scenarios. Uh, take an example of a YouTube app. YouTube app, what it needs to do is, when the screen is uh, when the screen is live and the YouTube app is running, you just need to make sure that screen doesn't lock. But when the user manually locks the screen, you don't the YouTube app doesn't need to run anymore. It can still put the processor to suspend mode. That's one scenario. And the scenario is an example of an app like Twitter. Twitter app doesn't need the screen, even the screen can lock, but even after locking, probably Twitter app will pull the internet to find if there are new tweets. So at that time, you can let the system lock the screen, but you cannot actually send the process to the suspend mode. So in that scenario, you need the process to be running and giving Twitter app some control, some kind of control so that it can again pull and get the value from the internet. So there are different kinds of wake locks provided by Android for each of these scenarios. A full wake lock will actually never lock the screen never kill the processor. It will always keep the processor alive and it will uh, actually keep the screen backlighting everything alive. On after uh, on after release uh, is another wake lock which probably uh, will uh, I guess uh, will you know when you press manually you, you lock the screen it will stop everything and partial wake lock is what I was talking about Twitter. It will uh, you know it will uh, lock the screen but the processor will be running in the background. Screen bright wake lock means uh, it will remain uh, the screen will remain brighter as well. Sometimes you can dim the screen at least. So the dim wake lock will keep the screen alive, but it will dim after some time. So these kind of different wake locks are available. Again, it's available. The complete specification of this is available in the market. So people, what they do is they actually acquire the wake lock and set the wake lock. So for example, if you take the Android phone and go to the settings and go to the system information, go to the battery usage, usually the 50% of the battery is used by display. So when you actually keep the screen awake, you are actually killing the battery like anything. So this full wake lock we acquire, say if somebody is watching a YouTube video and he acquires a full wake lock, after the video is finished, probably you should release the wake lock. Most of the applications, they don't release the wake lock. And what happens is the screen will uh, remain open, even when you press the home button and the app goes back in the uh, dormant state, still the wake lock is acquired, so it will remain all, on all the time, probably for hours, and the battery will probably die in half the time it should have actually died. So whenever you acquire a wake lock, try to release it after it's use. Another thing is services. And services is like something the most toughest thing to do and when you do a service you get like yeah I'm going to the next level. So uh, you you use service for everything. But uh, and we also found for, for many scenarios for like pulling the location, the background, things like that we thought service is the best way to go. But actually there are methods which you can actually eliminate services. For example if you want to pull the location, if you want to pull system states and all, we have actually system broadcasts. The, when the location information available, if you subscribe for the system broadcast in the XML file, you can actually get the broadcast even when your app is not running. So uh, you want to show a pop-up whenever you enter a region. So the simple solution would be run a service in the background, 
hold for location every 10 minutes. When you are in this GPS location, just put a pop up. That is simple implementation. The better implementation is just subscribe to the location change broadcast intent in the XML file, and whenever the location is changed, you will get the intent back to your application. In this way, you are actually saving the memory also, and you are actually removing a background application as well. So, another thing is uh, you can, you have the ways to set uh, services not to be per persistent. Uh, if you have seen, if you go to the system uh, settings and kill a service, it it will you know resurrect again. That is because in the settings in the Android manifest they have said that if a service is killed, please restart the service. So if your service needn't be restarted, if it's not something critical, if it's something like uh, it's a simple fun app something, if people, someone is killing the service, let it be, let it die, and the next time when you start an app, let the service come again. So uh, don't make the service persistent if not needed. And best part is uh, this is the most important thing: abide by the rules. Just blindly religiously follow the rules and they actually make your app a lot lot better and it will be future proof as well because the form factors of the device are changing and uh, uh, the, the capabilities of the device are changing. So if you st stick to the uh, guidelines, your app which is created for 1.6 will still run on a device on ice cream sandwich without much change needed you know. Again uh, another important thing is you can adapt your app to your system condition. For example, when you are using network. You, you get this uh, some broadcast in this from the system uh, uh, denoting about a system condition. This is what I told you earlier like when the network is turned off you don't have to pull. And another important thing is there is an event, there is a system broad, uh, so broadcast event called action, action battery chain that the system throws. This is, an, this is a broadcast event, Everybody, anybody can subscribe to that. So when the action battery is low, the, uh, the, you know, the actual value is the battery is low, you can actually turn off part of the system. For example, your GPS thing, your network thing, you can at least reduce your application usage of the GPS and network so that in low battery, your application is not the one who actually kills the system. Because you know, uh, the users, the way they perceive it, you are on low battery and you ta they take your app and your system says power off. They they do, they are not very intelligent or they are not very, they are just uh, laymen who will think that your app is the one who actually accelerated the shut shutdown of the system. So try to be a good guy and whenever the system condition is low, reduce everything, go to uh, you know. Uh, safer mode and you can using these kind of uh, system broadcast you can actually uh, disable some of the uh, facilities or uh, capabilities of your application. Also uh, you have specified some of the permissions in the applications uh, you know XML file. Say you have subscribed to the location, you subscribe for the um, uh, network things like that. You can actually go to the package manager class and during runtime you can disable these permissions. So that is also possible. So they give all kind of facilities for you to make uh, make your app as memory uh, you know, uh, optimize as possible, and it's up to you to actually implement that. Another thing is optimize the list, optimizing the list, because we are talking about list. Another problem I have seen is uh, the list. When you create a list, uh, that you don't really bother about optimizing. Uh, you you're more concerned about making it work properly. But you can actually optimize the list. For example, whenever you are downloading images from the list, you might use a thread to do that, so that you lazily load the image. But using a thread, make sure, for example, you are flicking a list, uh, list in a very fast, if you are doing a fast flick of the list, you don't have to load images for each of the list items. What will happen is, I have, uh, I will take the example of Twitter again, I flick the list very fast. So probably I would have skipped 100 items in a second, but I would have started 100 threads also to load 100 icons. Why do you need that? Need, need that? Because I am not going to see that icons. So when you can, what you can do is, you can listen to the scrolling, uh, scroll listener, and when only when the list stops, just load those items. Don't load the images and stuff for each of the, you know, list item that has been scrolling. So if I scroll 100 items in a second, I'm not going to load 100 threads and crash the system. And uh, again, uh, using threads, be very careful. There are a lot of, I know there are a lot of uh, uh, documentation of, about this on the internet, how to optimize threads on a list. Because uh, once you start a thread, you don't have, uh, you don't really have uh, much of a control how to stop it or how where it goes. It just runs in the background. So you start 20, 30 threads, because list, they have dynamic number of items, so you scroll down and up and you are starting threads here and there. So if you scroll down and up, you are actually starting through two threads for the same image, this kind of scenario ha happen, just think about it and you will find that you can actually op optimize these kind of scenarios. And as I told you uh, earlier, the Android list, list control is a very intelligent control, it will only load that much items, it will only uh, call that much views, it will only create that much views, it will cache the views, it will do a lot of things. And if you want to know more about that, just go to the Android uh, source code of the list view. Uh, it's very beautifully written. 
and uh, don't try to over optimize it or counter optimize it. And then in the closing I just want to say that uh, the Dalvik machine and the Java machine are not the same. The heap size and all those things are different. So don't, if you're even if you're a seasoned Java programmer you might be committing mistakes. Try to watch the Google videos. They are very very uh, important because they actually throw up a lot of new uh, light to your, the way you actually look into an Android program. And uh, don't just test, uh, try to check out the densities of the application when you uh, create an XML as he, told, he, as he told in the previous section, uh, you know, session. And uh, you can also check the Android source code. People think that Android source code is really hard to understand. It's a, it's a big, big, big code and you know, it's a rocket science. It's very simple. Anybody can understand. It's heavily documented. And whenever I try to create a custom control, I actually go to the Android source code and see how they have written a similar control and I start from there. It's very simple. And uh, you can use uh, a portal like Stack Overflow and Google Group. I know all of you know that. And uh, one more important thing is, uh, try, if when you are in, in doubt, you can actually call up these guys, you can actually ping these guys in Twitter or you know, Google Plus. If you have really have some problem, like uh, my list is not working properly, this is what happens to me. Uh, you can contact Ritomeyer, Romain Goya, Romain Rick. They actually respond to your queries if you have really issues and they'll give you answers. So that's what I would say. And I would like to thank my colleagues who tried to help me create this presentation. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask me. Hello everyone. Uh, due to time constraint, we'll have to end the session here. Uh, we'll thank Mr. Narayan for the quite an interactive session. Please give me a big round of applause.